So I will jump right into my presentation. Um, first, I would like to um, talk about a little bit of why we study um, protein interactions with nanomedicines. So nanomedicine actually enabled a new way of designing drugs. So that is all powered by nanomaterials that we can design um, with different surface ligands, with different sizes and shapes, and even materials. Um, as an example here, we can design a nanomaterials that can circulate through the intravenous injections to the tumor sites. And once they reach the tumor sites, because we can engineer the imaging agents on the surface of the nanomaterials, that the nanomedicine can both um, function as an imaging contrast agent and at the same time as a, as a therapeutic drug carrier. And as you can see here, to achieve this multifunction way of engineering a new therapy, it is all relied on how we can control the surface of these nanomaterials and how, how much we can control them in, well, as they travel through the body. And however, what researchers have found was that, as the left side, um, bottom, bottom left side shown here, is that as we expose our nanomedicines in plasma or any biological environment that contains high amount of proteins, these proteins can actually absorb to the surface of our nanomaterials. So the, on the left bottoms here, we have the gold nanoparticles um, before exposure to the plasma. And after the exposure to the plasma, as you can see here, there's a white halo um, formed around the surface of the nanoparticles. And, these, and that is the protein absorption layers. And because it looks like a corona around the sun, and therefore uh, this phenomenon has been called the protein corona. Now, um, for and that becomes an issue because the very surface that we designed for our nano medicines to behave uh, in the body actually uh, gets modified by the body. So we can start with a synthetic identity that tells us as the functions that we want our nanomaterials to do uh, gets changed into a biological identity that is determined by the proteins on, it, on its surface and therefore leading our nanomaterials to a different receptors or even a different biochemical cascades that we want them to interact with. And that, that is a reason why there's many studies have been trying to understand what are these proteins on the surface of nanomaterials. And uh, many studies have been characterized different uh, materials, what proteins are on, on, on its surface, and that includes uh, different proteins. Um, as you can see here, we can find the identities of these proteins and the amount of each proteins. Now, the objective of our study is actually wanted to take this a little bit further. We wanted to look at of all of these identified proteins, which of them are functional. And that, there's a reason to that, because in a biological context, technically, the only the proteins that are functional are the ones that are going to be matter or are the ones that are more interesting for us to understand what are these proteins affecting our nanomaterials. So we wanted to see whether these characterized proteins are all functional on the surface of the nanomaterials. And of course, we want to understand why that's the case. We start our study by looking at the protein's functionality on nanoparticles. And we developed an assay that is slightly modified immunosorbent assay, and that's also known as the ELISA. How we achieve that is by first immobilizing our nanomaterials on a solid substrate, which is a positively charged microwell um, plates. Now these wells are positively charged by incubating with polylysines and polylysine at pH seven is positively charged. And the proteins on the surface of particles are actually negatively charged because proteins are net negative at pH seven as well. So, and then we can use electrostatic interactions to immobilize our protein coated particles onto the well plates. As you can see from the bottom right corner here, the immobilized particles form this red color on the well, and then we can control the amount to load to each plate and we use gold nanoparticles in our study and they exhibit red color. And that, that's why you see these colors. Now, after we immobilize these nanomaterials, we can then add the um, primary antibodies and secondary antibody, just like in the uh, regular ELISA. And we also have a standard curve on a different well, just to tell us the amount of proteins that we can find um, that are functional on the surface of particle. There's the reason why we would know the functionality of these proteins is because the, the antibodies will only bind to the proteins that are in the native structures, but the binding size is available but for binding. So through that, we have a way of looking at whether these proteins are accessible for binding or not. 
Now, moving forward, we use this assay on 24 proteins on the surface of nanoparticles, and we chose these 24 proteins based on their abundance. And, and after running the assay, we found out that all of these proteins all have a very different amount on the, uh, of the numbers of functional proteins on the particles. Now, what's more important is actually when we add them all together and we know the amount of each individual proteins that are absorbed in the protein corona. Now, when we add them all together, it actually only add up to about 27.4%. So what that's telling us is that not all absorbed proteins are functional. And in fact, we only, using our assay, was only able to find only a third of them. So we thought, so if not all proteins are functional, that actually makes us thinking why that's the case. And there are a few hypotheses, and one of them we think is because when these proteins are sitting in this corona absorption layers, is it possible there's multiple layers and that this another layer is covering the proteins underneath that and therefore blocking the binding sites. Now, for that to happen, the protein has the proteins have to bind to each other and build on top of each other. So we thought that is it possible we can look at the protein-protein interactions as a way to indicating that maybe that's possible. So what we did is we uh, developed another assay, essentially on the left side here. We start with releasing all these absorbed proteins from the surface of nanoparticles and while maintaining their native uh, structure. And then we immobilize them one at a time. And by doing so, if that protein is bind to another proteins, the immobilization of that one protein will also co-capture uh, the proteins that bind to the, the, the target proteins. And once that's being co-captured, we can then figure out what that co-captured proteins are. So on the right side, here's a result of that assay. We find out that there's multiple protein, protein interactions happening within the corona. That could be very well the reason why um, these proteins are not functional because they can actually form these assembly structure in the corona that um, covered their binding sites. Now, with that results, we wanted to see why, what, what can we do with that um, finding? So we started by thinking, if the structures and the functions are related for the proteins in the corona, then can we change the structure of the corona somehow modify the function of proteins as well? We started by looking at immunoglobulin G or IgG as a target proteins to study. Now, IgG is known for resulting premature clearance of nanoparticles in vivo. So we thought that would be a pretty good interesting protein to modify its function in the corona. So we found, we use our assay, we identified all the um, binding partners of the IgG. And we knocked out each one of them and look at how does that change the functions of the IgG. And on the right side here, we find out is that when we knocked out the antithrombin 3, the functionality of the IgG dropped almost half. And that also resulted the much, much less binding of nanoparticles to macrophages. On the left side here, the top row is the human serum-coated nanoparticles. As you can see here through the overlay pictures, lots of particles being uptake by the macrophages. Now, if we knocked out the antithrombin from that corona, the because the IgG functionality decreased by half, it also results much, much less of the particles binding to the macrophages. And on the right side here is a quantification of that assay and again, confirming uh, what we found. So that leads to, <coughs> excuse me. So that leads to the summary of our study. So we, we characterize the functions and the structure of the proteins and we find out that not all of them are functional. And part of the reason why is that they can bind to each other that actually covered their binding sites available for binding. Now, moving forward, what we can continue on this road is essentially try to piece together the full picture between our nanomaterial designs, what proteins absorb onto the surface, and the, what targets are they binding to. We started with hundreds of proteins that we identify on the surface of particles. We narrow it down to maybe only 10 to 20 functional proteins. And then maybe the next step is going from that 10 to 20 proteins, we can then validate whether these proteins are actually binding to the receptors itself on the surface of the cell. And through there, and through, through that, we can figure out essentially um, what proteins will affect in what ways leading our nanomaterials to in interact what cells, for example. And that way we can eventually able to design the nanomaterials, hopefully with control targets in vivo. And of course, in the very future that hopefully our nanomedicine can be controlled while we're injected, in, uh, injecting them into the body. And with that, I would like to um, thank everyone for listening today.
we have a written question, which reads, great presentation. Which nanoparticles are you using for your corona studies? Right. So in our paper, we use 60 nanometer in diameter gold nanoparticles. And they're spherical. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Marshall, are there any other questions? Only if you have one. I do have one. So, Johnny, I'm wondering if um, non-functional proteins in the corona, is it possible that this is because of the orientation on the nanoparticle is limiting their binding site? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the possibility for that, for that to happen. And, and so, again, the protein's function is because of multiple reasons. One of them is whether that protein itself are functional or not on the surface. And that could be because they're either in a wrong orientations, that could be that they've been denatured. Um, and what we also, in this study, what we essentially is on top of that, what we already known is that there's also another possibility that these proteins can actually bind to another protein by itself that actually limiting their binding sites. But all of these could be happening in the corona, yes. Great, and then like what was mentioned in, I believe, Missy's presentation, a lot of nanomaterials are modified with PEG to help reduce the adsorption of the protein corona. What are the implications on those to your, your findings for nanomaterial design? Mm, right. So um, most studies, yes, most studies used in vivo um, because of protein corona, they have to design their surface with PEG or any sort of um, anti-fouling polymers to reduce the protein absorptions so that at least they don't get cleared out too, too fast. And, and that, that's fine. But what we're trying to achieve here is that is a possible way that we don't have to rely on PEG because having PEG is, doesn't solve the entire issue. Um, having PEG, actually, we missed out the entire possibilities of having access to uh, different receptors on cells, um, different protein biochemical cascades in the bodies. We essentially give that all away and because we have no control over what proteins absorb onto the surface. So what we're trying to achieve here is maybe by understanding more of how these proteins are absorbed in the first place and what can we use these proteins and eventually, hopefully we can design particles and actually be able to utilize these protein absorptions and make it functional in the, in the body. Yeah, that's the Great. goal. Thank you, Johnny. And actually, I misspoke. It was Peyton who mentioned PEG. Uh, Marshall, are there any other questions? Yes, we have another written question. This comes from Arahant Singh, who asks, did you prepare the assay test in-house? And if yes, then please elaborate on this process. Um, yes, essentially, we, we made these assay uh, in-house. The the well plates are positively charged by re-incubating with polylysines, and that's the reason uh, how we can get the particles to uh, absorb onto the plate. Um, or although the antibodies and the secondary antibodies we all purchase commercially, and that's actually one of the reason why uh, we are limited to some of the protein choices we have, and that's because we actually need to find these antibodies and secondary antibodies that we can uh, actually use. So yes, the um, for the ELISA for the first part of the ELISA, we parts of it we engineer uh, in our in our own lab. Yeah. And you can look for more details uh, how we did that in the paper. Great, thank you, Johnny, and thank you, Arahant, for that question.